Hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, this is the second of the webinar series that we have been doing now. Uh, today's presentation is going to be looking at the uh, PLA uh, military exercises in Tibet and the Sino-Indian border areas. And uh, what, are they, what does it mean for India? What are the implications for India, uh, India's own security calculations? Uh, so I'm particularly thankful. Uh, our chair this morning, Dr. Manu Joshi, will be joining in a few minutes late, uh, technical difficulties. Uh, he's having some difficulty in joining us, uh, but uh, I'm sure that he'll be joining us very soon. Uh, meanwhile, I want to thank uh, the two discussants and my uh, co-author for joining uh, this morning. Uh, this is a paper that I have been wanting to do for a very long time because even chronicling uh, the number of uh, Chinese uh, military exercises in Tibet and the border areas are absolutely important for India to keep track of and monitor the kind of developments that are happening uh, around the uh, border areas because it has imp uh, important security uh, implications for India. So this is something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. So I thank uh, Pulkit in joining me to uh, co-author this paper. And second, I'm uh, thankful to both Ambassador Vijay Nambiar as well as Brigadier Deepak Sinha uh, for joining this, uh, this morning as the two discussants for this paper. Uh, I work with uh, Dr. Nambiar, with um, uh, Ambassador Nambiar uh, at the NSCS when he was the DNSA and of course uh, Brigadier Sinha as the colleague at OR for a long time. Uh, I really value both of your uh, uh, comments, inputs uh, in today's uh, discussions. Uh, so thank you to this. Um, so uh, till uh, Dr. Joshi uh, comes in and take... I'm, I'm there now. Oh, oh great. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I'm there now. Okay. So, since I think Raji has done the introduction thing, uh, all I can do is to apologize because uh, technology issues, but welcome to uh, ORF's um, uh, uh, seminar. Dr. Uh, uh, Raji Gopal has already uh, introduced some of the parts of the subject. <coughs> we will uh, now go on all the way. We'll try and um, uh, end at about maybe 12.35 or 12.40 because we have uh, gotten off uh, this thing uh, a bit late. So what I uh, plan is that um, uh, Dr. Rajagopalan and Pulkit kind of speak till about uh, what uh, uh, about 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 0, 5, 12 10. Yeah. and then uh, we have the two discussants uh, who will get uh, another ten minutes each. And um, so I'm not going to make any kind of formal remarks, um, um, Mr. Nambiar uh, and uh, Brigadier Sena are well known to uh, most people here, except to say that, you know, uh, by way of introductory remarks that what we've seen in, the, in Tibet uh, has been uh, as one part of an action reaction cycle, meaning the Chinese modernize uh, their defenses, then we get into our modernization from 2003 down to 2010, we began a modernization cycle. Um, and then the Chinese get back into their modernization cycle, which began around uh, 2010. And these exercises actually uh, are providing a manifestation of the latest manifest, uh, the latest um, uh, uh, modernization cycle that the Chinese are undergoing. So um, um, I've gone through the paper, it's extremely comprehensive and details uh, some of the stuff. So I'll ask Dr. Rajagopala now uh, to make her remarks. And as I said, uh, if you can um, uh, compress them, and I think now uh, till about 12, 10, it will be great because we can keep control of the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for, uh, for that uh, quick introductory uh, remarks, very brief one. Uh, so let me just get on with the presentation. So uh, clearly, I think uh, uh, there are issues. In so in terms of the structure, uh, we look at in very brief the PLA military reforms and uh, reorganization that have been undertaken, uh, especially in the Tibet uh, and the Sino-Indian border areas, and then chronicle the military exercises in the Tibet and Sino-Indian border areas. Look at the, uh, also the gaps in terms of the Sino-Indian border infrastructure because that at the end of the day aids the mobilization process, which is absolutely critical. And finally, to look at the, uh, what are the implications of PLA's joint exercises, uh, exercises for India. Um, so the context is again, very clear to all of us. Uh, there has been a more assertive foreign policy under President Xi Jinping. So ever since he's coming to office in 2012, you have seen a much more assertive or even rather aggressive some, in some cases, uh, a sort of a foreign policy under Xi Jinping. Uh, there have also been changes in the operational structure of the PLA to achieve greater joinness and integration and thereby bringing in more efficiency to their military functioning. 
Uh, of course, this has all been unleashed by the, through the military reforms undertaken in 2015 onwards. Of course, the goal of the PLA is to be a fully modern military by 2035 and a world-class military by 2050. There has also been the look to, to look at the Chinese defense paper, uh, the last one that was given in 2015 and the, just the, uh, the, la the very latest, last, latest one that we have in 2019. 2015 was still had a China had a very defensive orientation to the uh, to the uh, in the in the defense white paper uh, that is protecting its own national interests very defensive oriented uh, approach to that when we were compared the current uh, defense white paper which is a much more aggressive one to stay competitive to achieve certain number of parity with the uh, with the big powers with the U.S. and so on and so forth those are the underlying principles. Uh, in the in the latest uh, defense white paper, so that has also been conditioning the Chinese uh, military's approach in the especially in the Tibet Autonomous Region and the border areas. Uh, and this is again, like uh, Dr. Joshi said, this has also been increasingly evident in the number of military exercises, uh, including joint ones, joint ones between the PLA Army and the PLA Air Force. So again, these are very very clearly reflective of the growing assertiveness under President Xi Jinping. Uh, interestingly, they have been uh, for a, more than a decade now rearranging of China's missile facilities uh, and strengthened military presence in Tibet areas. Delinga is just one case in point, but there are, have been other uh, other facilities, other important uh, uh, developments as well in this regard. Then, of course, China's strengthened border infrastructure that goes to aid all of this uh, in a in a more efficient manner. Uh, let me just hand it over to uh, Pulkit to take forward the uh, next bit. Pulkit. Uh, yeah, sure. I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for joining us and I hope everyone's taking care and staying safe. So I'm going to be covering the uh, military reforms and reorganization and uh, covering the joint exercises that have taken place in the past decade or so. So as mentioned by Raji, the PLA went through the most comprehensive restructuring since the late uh, 70s and the early 80s in November 2015, when it was announced that the PLA would go through a reorganization at the CMC uh, plenary session. The CMC is the Central uh, Military Commission, where it was decided that China's seven military regions would uh, be turned into five theater commands, which would create a more joint uh, command with the ground, naval, air, and rocket forces. The five theater commands are the Western, Northern, Eastern, Southern, uh, commands and um, they all report to the CMC, uh, which has created a consolidated role of the CMC through a central and unified leadership. Uh, post the reorganization, two important points to note are that the Northern Command focuses on the Russian Far East and the Korean Peninsula, whereas the Western Command, which essentially covers about half the country, focuses on most of the border areas as well as the Aksai Chin areas. In, um, okay. So as we look at this map, we can see that the Northern Theater Command and the Western Theater Command cover most of the area and the Western Theater Command gives significance uh, in the implications of the military exercises and the reorganization for India. This is a closer look at uh, China's Western Theater Command. Um, the new command and control system under the reorganization clarifies the operational command from between the service headquarters to the theater commands through a joint operations command center. These command centers are also responsible for joint exercises. Uh, through this reorganization, there has also been an establishment of the strategic support force as well as the joint logistic support force in order to create more jointness and strengthen combat efficiency. The SSF is responsible for electronic and cyber warfare, and as well as psychological operations for military personnel. China's advanced info optical network has also been responsible in linking the Tibet Autonomous Region with mainland China through an extensive and widespread optical fiber cable network. Uh, China's VSAT stations also feed into the general effective command and control network within Tibet. In terms of the military exercises, uh, the PLA has been focused on gaining more operational experience in the possibility of an inadvertent conflict, which is why their emphasis has been on battlefield readiness and a general better operational experience, 
specifically in high altitude areas uh, a point to note is that a large number of regiments have been deployed in the tibetan military district which is near the border areas and although uh, china has uh, upped its uh, military exercises in the past 5 or so years it is important to note that there has been a general trend of increase in exercises over the past decade one of the early instances that we have looked at in this paper are in october 2011 where we saw two joint exercises aimed at practicing a division size force in an integrated manner uh, in chengdu and lanzhou uh, through the pla's air force units in uh, 2013 there was a general increase in the use of uh, the air forces aircrafts and helicopters for patrolling of the border areas in the ladakh sector um in august 2014 there was a report of pla aircraft in lanzhou increased in combat confrontation exercises and the year 2015 saw uh, an an in, increased presence in exercises by the pla in the tar some of the uh, instances of these exercises have been listed below uh, for example the j11 and su27 aircraft of the air force were seen engaged in regular exercises there was also an emphasis on uh, preparing for battle at night through routine training programs and there were regular training and live fire exercises conducted by regiments such as the second artillery rocket artillery and the army brigade of the tar uh there were a lot of war like situations created in order for the pla to address and acknowledge its weaknesses and uh, look at problems associated with mechanical failures battle damage repair and to in general strengthen the pla's ability in battle command and practice the use of uh, equipment in war like situations uh there as we see there has been an emphasis uh, emphasis on joint operations as the pla planned more than 100 joint integrated operations Uh, geared towards uh, preparedness for rapid deployment in the border areas. Uh, 2017 is a key year since the Doklam standoff took place, and a lot of the joint military exercises in the TAR um, created a sort of uh, intensified the tension between India and China during these times. Um, for example, a live fire drill with the Ground Combat Brigade of the PLA Tibet Regional Command was conducted to validate its combat capabilities. There were a lot of practice sessions uh, for rapid deployment and uh, anti-aircraft defense. There was another uh, live fire war game conducted by the Combat Brigade, and uh, the PLA also started testing a new type of tank for the purpose of mountain warfare. 2018 there was a focus on the general improvement of uh, airports and helipads and their establishment as well as um, the deployment of a lot of aircrafts and jets for on a more regular basis so uh, in terms of the upgradation of the air infrastructure the lassa gonga airport shigatse air base kwamdo vamda airport and the ningchi airport went through significant upgradation and there were new airports established in lassa and nagai There were also reports of construction taking place at the Kona Township in Tibet with regards to the specific uh, in air infrastructure upgradation. At uh, the Lhasa Gongar Airport, uh, it has been reported that there is a permanent deployment of two KJ-500 AEW aircrafts and a confirmed presence of a number of uh, fighter jets with the possible construction of a heavy military-grade uh, airstrip in addition to the two previously existing ones. and the possibility of an underground facility construction for storing ammunition at the shigatse airport there have been uav sightings in august 2017 and uh, the airport was uh, converted into a full military facility with the suspension of civil uh, flights similarly kwamdo vamda and ningchi airport have also been through upgradations and there are plans to further uh, do more upgradations um, The, there has also been a focus on creating a more cohesive uh, integration between civilian and mili military in Tibet in order to generally strengthen the logistics and overall capabilities. 
uh, in 2019 we saw that the tibetan military command had a new vehicle mounted howitzer in order to enhance the high altitude combat proficiencies as a part of the broader border security functions and there have also been further intensive combat training and participation of these tanks and howitzers for live fire shooting uh, exercises in the gobi desert um in 2019 there has been a lot of shooting practice of entire range of weapons including machine gun anti material sniper rifles and the aviation brigade of the pla air force which has been engaged in day and night drills and uh, the artillery brigade of the pla tibet uh, military region uh, has also conducted live fire drills to test the real combat uh, proficiency with addressing electronic jamming and communication loopholes uh pla's military mobilization for the training and purposes and possible conflicts in the future has also been aided by its uh, physical border infrastructure that it has developed and i'm going to pass it over to raji to um, discuss this further okay just one second dr rajagopalan would you like to make some more remarks on this i think you should yeah i'll just uh, quickly uh, run over the thing okay uh, what happened okay uh so quickly sharing the screen okay so uh thank uh, thanks pulkit uh, so coming to the uh, sino indian border infrastructure i think this has always been an important aspect uh when you look at the sino indian overall military competition and the security uh, vulnerabilities and so on and so forth uh here i would say that there are uh, several imbalances between china and india not just in terms of physical border infrastructure uh which china has upgraded over the last uh, couple of decades now to a, uh, to uh, to a state of the art uh, facilities and so on and so forth but also there are uh, in terms of weapons and equipment there are uh, uh, there are uh, massive discrepancies between india and china so that's something that india has to factor in uh, while looking at the overall uh, military and security calculations and mix uh, security calculations so there is a need to improve the overall connectivity including for border trade but also the ability to mobilize forces in an efficient in manner would depend on the kind of infrastructure that that are in play uh, as far as the chinese uh, infrastructure is concerned there is a 96000 km road network a 3000 km railway line connecting chinghai uh, kingai and to to tibet which has been extended to shigatse very close to the border areas in august 2014 uh, there is a lhasa ningchi uh, line to be ready by 2020 or 2021 Uh, there are uh, other uh, plans also in this regard so there are important markers for us to uh, watch out for again this is a, just a pictorial showing the kind of a distance so if you have a lhasa to ningchi it takes about for 2 to 3 hours covering about uh, for, uh, close to 450 kilometers so they have upgraded the infrastructure to quite an extent that is going to be beneficial to china in a big way uh, additionally they plan to launch a 1700 km railway line connecting sichuan to tibet uh, to be completed in 2025 26 uh, they plan to build three new airports in addition in the tar tibet autonomous region in addition to the five existing ones other upgradations are also being done uh interestingly there have been a number of uh, logistics and oil depots that have come about in the tibet autonomous region and the border areas this does provide for uh not only for the uh, pla to quickly mobilize forces but also sustaining them for a relatively longer period of time at the border areas uh, as far as the inadequacies are concerned uh there are uh, um, uh, i think this has been written about talked about uh from everybody from the military leadership to security analysts have talked about it uh most recently uh, in 2018 you had the uh, indian army vice chief of staff are uh, talking about the need for the lack of funds as a major issue in improving creating as well as uh, improving some of the strategic roads and infrastructure that is required in the border areas uh these have been ignored for uh, several decades both by the political agencies by political leadership military and the civilian military leadership all across the bureaucracies and other leadership have ignored this for a number of different reasons and i believe it is not just purely accidental but there have been a part of the calculated strategy and i would think that's a, that's been a very defeatist approach but thankfully in the last uh, more than a decade ago uh we made these changes by the uh, cabinet committee on security when they sanctioned the building of certain strategic roads it's about 73 strategic roads to be built up but i think we are still lagging behind in significant ways and so that's something that needs to be uh, addressed in a in a focused manner um 
I think uh, these are again detailed in the paper for shortage of time I'm going to run through. And uh, I think uh, the other important aspect that affects the border issues is the uh, multiplicity of agencies involved in securing the border on the Indian side. You have the Indian Army, Indo-Tibetan Border Police, the Border Security Force, the Assam Rifles. In effect, you have the, both the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Ministry of Defense coming into play. And the lack of coordination between different agencies involved has been a major challenge on the Indian side. And I think this is something that India should rectify. Because on the Chinese side, when you look at it, you have a single unified commander who is responsible for the entire TAR force. So this is something that India needs to do in terms of one is to build up the infrastructure that is required, uh, much needed, whether it is railway lines, road network, tunnels, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's something that, and of course, there are, uh, there are, there are challenges in improving India's uh, infrastructure. Uh, India faces tougher conditions, geological conditions. Himalayan uh, range is still a young one. Uh, and construction takes place on fissured rocks that are mixed with clay. So there are problems. Not, nobody is saying that, that nobody is denying that. But other countries, including China and Japan and other countries, have developed significant amount of infrastructure and connectivity projects have been done with a lot of these kind of challenges. So one has to find ways to improve this particular aspect. Uh, scarcity of raw materials for construction, shortage of qualified manpower, uh, and these are some of the problems. Uh, poor quality of labor, contractual uh, contractors, and so on and so forth, because there is also a kind of uh, interference from the state, uh, state leadership in terms of who should be uh, uh, taken on for a certain project, and so on and so forth. But I think uh, this is, uh, and of course, the most notorious of the delay and causing the delay has been the clearance from the Department of Environment and Forest. Uh, this has been a major problem uh, on during, earlier during the UPA uh, time, but I think this is still a continuing problem despite Modi government giving a greater emphasis on this particular area. Uh, coming to uh, the, what are the implications at the end of the day of the PLA exercises in Tibet and the uh, border areas? Uh, these are, of course, uh, troop mobilization, joint training, integration by the PLA. They have been very impressive, but they also do cause concern for India from a security perspective. Especially this is the case because of the unresolved border and territorial issues between the two, the security competition between the two sides, the fact that India is also a rising power at the same time, even though we are several uh, generations behind China, there is India, does, India is being looked at as a peer competitor to China and the, there are different political ambitions that are driving both the countries. Uh, so there is that problem going to continue forever in a sense, for a long, for a longer period of time. Uh, thus, I would say that the PL, uh, PLA's military buildup and the overall capability mix that China has, has assumed over the period over, over the last decade or so could produce possible, possibly favorable outcomes into, in favor of China, at least in the initial stages of the conflict. This is something that India has to be mindful of and consider in its, in its, uh, um, in its own calculations. Uh, this is, uh, I think for PLA, I think one of the biggest problems has been the lack of operational experience, which has been one of the most important deficiencies for the PLA. And this is precisely what the PLA is trying to address through the number of increased number of joint exercises and military drills in this area. Uh, focus on uh, joint and integrated military operations also bring about a synergistic approach under informationized conditions. Uh, like uh, Pulkit said, the improved infrastructure, aiding all of this, has also, they have been able to validate the effectiveness of the acute moment, acute troop deployment and mobilization of rapid forces capabilities. This is now possible under all weather conditions. Uh, they have also been able to validate the effectiveness of their command and control networks. Again, it's, it's still a, a challenge, I would think, but I think they have been making serious efforts in this regard. Uh, troop mobilization capabilities, again, validate the effectiveness, both from operational as well as mobilization perspective. So these are something that uh, India needs to take a lesson for uh, its own kind of prepare, preparedness levels as well. Uh, overall military balance in favor of China as seen with the increased number of uh, air deployment and so on and so forth. This was most recently uh, talked about by the former Indian Air Force uh, Chief, uh, Air, Air Chief Marshal Danova. Uh, but again, this is, uh, there's only one more factor that India needs to uh, kind of take a, take a look at in a sense. Um, PLA's exercises, again, have been, uh, they have been able to make clear assessment on the effectiveness of jointness and integration, how well they are done. Uh, in this particular path. Uh, military regions to move, shifting from military regions to theater commands again have aided better military integration because the earlier military regions, each of the commanders had quite a bit of uh, autonomy 
uh, and independence. So this is, in a sense, the military uh, theater commands are seen as a much better um, system in terms of building better administrative jointness and integration. Uh, operational jointness, like I said, and integration still could be an issue, but they're certainly making the efforts and that is worth um, noting in a sense, for, worth monitoring in a sense. Um, so there is no clarity till such time that they actually engage in an actual operation to see, but they are, I think this is something that India should be looking at in very seriousness. Um, to conclude, uh, this is clearly uh, the increased Chinese military exercises and uh, drills are a reflection of the Chinese president, Xi Jinping's, uh, Xi's greater emphasis on Chinese military competitiveness, which is highlighted in the, second, in the, last, uh, in the latest uh, defense white paper. Uh, there are serious security implications for India as a result of the PLA's ability to undertake joint and integrated operations uh, involving all the, uh, all the major forces under the PLA. Um, so these are issues that India should be uh, considering. India should uh, take note of and uh, plan its own kind of uh, uh, thing. I think that's somewhere one particular point which I wanted to talk about. Very quickly, I need to say that I think uh, on the border infrastructure, I think India needs to make a couple of important, uh, a couple of important decisions. One is to uh, have a coordinated single uh, agency, single window agency that would keep track of the border strategic border infrastructure projects. And I think this should be ideally be a body under the parliamentary uh, parliament so that it has a legal backing as well. Um, so this is a step that must be done uh, at, an, uh, at an early date so that we are able to uh, uh, track these projects on a, uh, on a much more efficient manner. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to ask, uh, see your questions and comments when we we'll be discussing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raji. Uh, what I would like to do is to tell all the audience that uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A uh, section here. And subsequently, we, uh, if we have the time, uh, we will request um, um, uh, our panelists to uh, respond to them. So now uh, what I'll do is I'll request uh, um, Ambassador Vijay Nambiar uh, to make his comments. And uh, uh, so, uh, Vijay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manoj, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is, uh, it's been a very, very competent, uh, detailed analysis. And you, you know, in a sense, I was first in China during the old PLA in 70, during the culture of the 3 8 working style. And this was a completely different PLA under Mao, People's War, and things like that. That was completely changed after 79, of course, and with Deng Xiaoping uh, changed it, upgraded and reformed. Then Jiang Zemin came, and of course, then you had all up to all up, almost up to Xi Jinping's time, it was really defensive uh, war, as, as uh, Raji mentioned in the, uh, in the white paper 15, uh, 15, 2015. And now you have a qualitative change in the approach and attitude of China now self-consciously moving away, as it were, from hiding its light under a bushel, as Tang Xiaoping talked about, Yang Guang, you know, this, uh, uh, the hiding your, uh, your, your capabilities. He's moved out now to openly doing it and sort of showing it and having what you call a coercive kind of action, uh, kind of uh, motivated approach to, uh, to uh, the tactics at the field level. Now, the main thing which I'd like to look at from the, as a diplomat, as a former diplomat, is apart from the fact of the old marshals of the, old, of the previous times, you find a, a general who was actually an instructor in the Academy of Military Sciences last year talking about his regret that he has never fought a war. So there is this question of combat experience, which is an important question. And particularly, of course, you can make the argument that Combat experience is not everything, and that in today's world, particularly with the kind of uh, high-quality training, the understanding of weapons capabilities, and a whole the question of domain knowledge in various areas, exp combat experience is not that can be over exaggerated, perhaps. But you know, in particularly in the exchanges between India and uh, China in the border, they are marked not by except for one particular in 1962, you're not marked by any kind of major kind of thing, but it's close distance uh, encounters of, you know, uh, con uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of staring each other. And that actually calls for a certain amount of experience in terms of both the possibilities of 
where to escalate, where to, you know, it's a kind of, it requires a kind of psychological uh, you know, capability to negotiate through what may be called the fog of possible war, not just the fog of war. But that kind of thing requires a certain amount of experience, which I'm not sure whether training itself can actually provide because it has, it, you know, you've had a lot of tensions, you've had lots of incidents, whether you talk of uh, uh, after 67, I don't think India has really been, a, been, been bettered or bested by the Chinese side on any of these major incidents. And that was mainly because of a certain sense of an approach to the issue where it was very graded, it was very well calculated. And I think on both sides there has been that. Now, with this new kind of concept of coercive action, we are facing a difference in this, which has already been shown in Doklam to some extent, a difference in att attitude. And there, apart from the fact that the entire exponential buildup in terms of infrastructure, training, I mean, 80 trainings between in eight years is, is remarkable. And 80 exercises in eight years, it shows that there is a, also a strong effort to psychologically, in a sense, also overpower the, uh, the opponent, as it were, by the sheer, uh, the sheer volume of training, the volume of, of uh, of infrastructure, the volume of equipment. But I don't think that that necessarily is having the kind of effect on the Indian Army, even though I think uh, there are clearly, as uh, Raji has mentioned, certain uh, the, uh, difficulties, deficiencies, both objective as well as, uh, I know for a long time when I was JS, we had a problem about building roads right up to the, up to the uh, border because people were afraid that the Chinese would come down the road. I mean, we, instead of our needing to go around, there are these kind of psychological issues which we've had in the past, but I think we've gone over that to a large extent. And I think there has been, in terms of our approach also, by and large, a certain amount of uh, cap capacities on our part to be able to, in a sense, not blink and take on. The, the, the only difficulty now I see is the, adopting the defensive posture in terms of doctrine all through has meant that in all the previous exchanges which we've had with Pakistan, for example, China, apart from some saber rattling, has not really done anything which has actually, in a sense, made us uh, divert attention from our major engagements with Pakistan. This, I think, could change. There is now, if there is a willingness, because I think the overall attitude towards the relationship with Pakistan has actually also been uh, much more solidified. There are interests in terms of the, the CPEC and various things like that. It's become much more zero sum in terms of the relationship. And therefore, one does see that there is, a, we need to be much more careful. And at the same time, obviously, in terms of our ability to, to in a sense, cope, not just with the major psychological buildup of infrastructure, et cetera, but to have enough one, for not to be taken by surprise at any of these major points which we've had in the past, and there could be new points. In fact, uh, Asafila, et cetera, in the Northeast has been uh, uh, an area where there has been uh, difficulties in the past, and there could be long, the Longju, that area. And you can have it in various other places too, in the Northeast as well as in, in the, in the, uh, on the Western sector. And I think it is important for India to be, to, in terms of the the preparation to be a lot more prepared not to be taken by this particular, by surprise, as I think that is probably the only major clear and present threat which we have at present. I don't think there's going to be a huge uh, kind of, a, you know, a raging war, as it were, with all the things being involved, because that's, I think that at the present stage uh, in, the, in the development of both countries, that is not practically possible or likely. But obviously, there is a very strong amount of projection on, of, on the Chinese side, and we have to cope with that. And I think our responses, right from the, from the checkerboard onwards, has made sure that we will not be taken by surprise. It is important for us now in the present context of both the technical and the technological kind of emphasis with China, with China has been making. I don't see, with, particularly with the, the point you've mentioned about uh, Kanonet and about this 
uh, VSAT, uh, you know, uh, sort of applications, whether they will be in a position from the distance with minimum, without taking any casualties, to be able to uh, take you know, action which can be seriously uh, unbalancing to us. And then, of course, that would be important because for, any, for China in the present stage, if they were to do anything in the, in the border, bound, in, in terms of localized conflict with India, uh, they must have uh, substantial, if not complete success. Even if they have uh, about 40, 50 percent success is not enough. I think for us, if we are actually coping with these kinds of their attack, we'll have to just holding out itself is enough for us. Now, I'm not sure whether the Indian army is really the doctrine in the, at least as far as the, uh, <clears throat> as, the uh, uh, as, as the border relationship with China is concerned, whether we are thinking in terms of anything more than that. And I think it is important for us to look at how we are able to cope. And to some extent, I think the new theater command with the integrated air defense, uh, which in particularly the, 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 once that comes in, in fully into, into operation, I'm sure that that will give us a certain amount of uh, capacity. And I understand that uh, in terms of some of the equipments, the Chinese have been talking about the fact that we've been when the, new air chief, when the new army chief came, he talked about, you know, we are going to, uh, we're going to upgrade our, even our, the weapons that we have there, et cetera, howitzers, et cetera, as well as uh, uh, jet, uh, the, fi the cap fighter aircraft capabilities and as well as mobility to those, to those particular areas. I think that is going to make a major, uh, and of course, uh, the, the reference to the BrahMos uh, missile possible uh, deployments uh, around in, in, in respect of that particular sector also. These are perhaps uh, attempts by India to be able to say that all your pro pro projection, of course, we'll have to make, uh, we'll have to take action to, to counter these, but psychologically, they're not going to be effective. Even in 1962, my brother used to say this very often, uh, if the the, the, the major problem in 1962 was actually a failure of the higher direction of war. At the, at the field level, I don't think India at any time has had a sense of inferiority in terms of the fighting capabilities vis-a-vis. -vis. But today, it's not that which is going to count. It is going to, the, what is going to count is how, is a, the long distance kind of, and the use of technology. And I think there, we face a challenge and we'll have to do something very, very, uh, uh, very urgently, and as uh, Raji has said, the whole idea of uh, of infrastructure, how we are able to get uh, at least not uh, we obviously uh, we, we need to have the adequate infrastructure. And I think at the present moment, given the the physical sort of uh, an objective difficulties in that sector from our point of view, it will take a lot of doing. That is not only something that the parliament and the and the official sort of levels should be involved with. But I think even at the operational level, the logistics command, which the, when, the joint, when the jointness is being considered, that will also have to be taken when you have one, uh, one particular leadership level. And I think there, uh, why I can say that overall, time. yeah, just, uh, I'm finishing. Overall, I think that what we need to do is largely, we need to see that the, <clears throat> Any that we are not taken by surprise, and I think that can, that that is the the because that can change the psychological, and I think that's the only real uh, edge which China is looking for in terms of any kind of possible engagement with India. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Brigadier Sinha, uh, if you can keep it as compact as possible, because we are not completely out of time. Right, I'll do that. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Joshi. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, my compliments uh, to Brigadier, the... your uh, face is up. Can you put your screen oh, yeah, up? The, yeah, yeah, the yeah, sorry. Telephone. Uh, can, you, can you see me now? Okay. We can see you, but it's looking as though you're looking down at it. Yeah, so if you can... Yeah, it is slightly down, actually. <laughs> just, let me just try and get it up. Okay. Ah, that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I'd like to compliment the... Uh, uh, the authors for a wonderful paper. Uh, its importance, in my opinion, is not so much in what it 
tells us about the implications of the PLA exercises in Tibet, but more for what it says about overall Chinese attitudes and intentions, the impact of the reforms, and the impact of in, on the infrastructure on both sides of the LSE. I just make a few comments uh, as from the perspective of a practitioner. Uh, let me touch on training first. Uh, it's my, uh, in my view, the exercises are in Tibet are just posturing and uh, basically public relations attempts chiefly for, the, for domestic con consumption, but also, of course, to tell us what they're doing. Uh, all armies routinely conduct unit and formation level exercises. These are used to assess professional abilities of commanders, familiarize them with their unit and or, or their, them and their units and formations with their operational roles or to try out new concepts. Uh, they have some intelligence value in the sense that they help us fill in gaps in the overall intelligence picture of our adversary, but not too much. Indeed, uh, from, from the training point of view, the most uh, critical void in their training that we can exploit and should look at is their system of conscription. Cons conscripts, they take conscripts, I think, twice a year and uh, on, on an annual basis. Uh, and uh, their conscripts undergo a training of just 40 days of basic training before they join their units. Compare this to our recruits who undergo a year's training, which is still considered insufficient by units. Around 70% of conscripts, that's around 300,000, are inducted into the ground forces. And most probably end up in the infantry, which is the least technical. This means that the infantry battalions probably have 25% of their troops either leaving or coming in. And, some, and these 25 have rudimentary training at best of times. So in my... In my view, uh, the impact on, of this on their motivation, on their unit cohesion, and uh, performance of the battalion actually is in great doubt. Uh, the second aspect on, on, on training that I'd like to touch on is that of uh, the uh, uh, Special Operations Forces and the RRF, uh, RRF uh, Brigades, the Rapid Reaction Force Brigades. Now, uh, they are supposed to play, and as per their writings, they are to, they are to play a major role in any, uh, any future conflict. Yet, uh, there is information to suggest that they have only commenced integrated airborne training of their airborne corps, for example, uh, of uh, integrated airborne drops using personnel and heavy equipment at the same time, only since 2015. That suggests that capabilities are still quite rudimentary. I mean, we've been doing it from the 40s and 50s, actually. Uh, on the question of uh, reforms, I think uh, the various points have been made as to how the theater commands are going to enhance jointship, uh, jointmanship and uh, will also provide better command and control, coordination and synchronization of the battlefield. Uh, Understandably, in any conflict with us, the commander uh, of their Western theater will be responsible for the land battle and the commander of their su Southern theater probably for the naval, engage naval engagement. In contrast, on our side, we have eight operational commands which will be involved and each of these is located separately. Uh, though hopefully this will certainly change in the not too distant future and um, one hopes that Assam will be considered for the location of our Eastern Theatre headquarters, preferably across the Brahmaputra, <laughs> if uh, people think right. The point regarding uh, the issue which I'd like to raise about their Western Theatre is that uh, given the wide remit of responsibility that the commander of Western Theatre has, will he be in a position to actually exercise command uh, in, a, in, a, in a conflict situation? Over, over the whole whole uh, battle zone. In case he is going to hand it over or it's going to devolve on the Tibet military command to carry out operations against us, uh, we must remember that the T uh, TMC uh, actually comes under directly under the CMC. And this again is a gray area which will uh, have, have, uh, uh, have some impact later. Uh, the infrastructure issues have been uh, brought out. I mean, the very 
basic that has happened is that they can now bring in about 30 or 32 divisions and launch an offensive in a single campaigning season, which they couldn't do earlier, which in which they had to first bring in one uh, 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 one season they required for build up and the second for uh, launching offensives. The, of course, they can also it's it's facilitated their move of strategic assets, which can disrupt our rail and road uh, communications, our uh, vital bridges, command and control centers, etc. Uh, he also has the facility to move uh, and deploy mechanized units in eastern Ladakh and North Sikkim, where we still got very limited forces available, mechanized forces that is. And it provides him multiple options and flexibility for application of combat power in any chosen sector. It's already been brought out that we have a very, we suffer from a lot of infirmity, infirmities that uh, because of our decrepit uh, communication system, and uh, which imposes delay on concentration of forces and moving of reserves. But that has forced us uh, to adopt a forward deployment posture, which, uh, which has its own attendant logistics problems. Fortunately, as has been brought out, increasing attention is being paid to this, and uh, the situation will improve in, in, in the times to come. Uh, finally, I'd just like to touch on a few issues which I think uh, I see as deterrent or disuse, uh, 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 as dissuasive factors that work in our favor. First, that Ambassador, uh, Ambassador uh, Nambir had brought up is the of perception of victory. Uh, while we see Kargil as a decisive victory, there are those in Pakistan who will disagree because they believe it allowed them to bring Kashmir back into the international fora and gave a boost to the insurgency which had nearly died down. Brigadier, we have just one minute left. Right, sir. Just I just I just complete this. Just I have this only. Similarly, if we can achieve a stalemate against them, uh, against the Chinese, that would certainly add to our point. The issue of combat experience has already been made. The uh, terrain, uh, extreme high altitude is tough on troops, weapons and equipment. And uh, I would certainly say that uh, Technology cannot play that much of a part as it's expected to. The, 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 the defender will always be at an advantage and troop ratios uh, required for attack can be as high as 1 as to 10. We have an inherent military advantage because we, the communications, uh, line of communications which he has can be in, interdicted by us as well. And finally, I'd just like to add uh, I'll cut short everything else, is that our counter-offensive capabilities are quite robust now that the uh, Mountain Strike Corps is more or less operational and we have a sizable number of uh, special operations forces that can be employed, including against, uh, to create problems for them in the Tibetan plateau itself. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brigadier Sinha. Uh, what I'll do is that I have some, uh, I would like to make some comments. There are, uh, Raji, there are a number of questions that are there. I'm sure you can see them. But obviously, uh, we've got some uh, 12 questions or 16 yeah. questions. Yeah. But, uh, so we can't possibly answer all of them. Yeah, I'll try and club uh, them. Yeah, some of them are kind of comments and some of them yeah. are kind of very broad uh, yeah. uh, in their nature, which you would require an entire, entirely different seminar to uh, respond to. So what I suggest is that uh, you pick on just one or two salient yeah. thing, and of course the, the remarks made by the uh, uh, the uh, discussants um, uh, on this, and then uh, if you can do it quickly uh, in uh, in, in uh, ten minutes, then I'll take five minutes and uh, 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 wind up the thing. Okay. And you can divide the time with Pulkit if you like. Yeah, you absolutely. Know. Yeah, Pulkit, let me know where which are the ones that you want to Anyway, just quickly uh, run over there. I think uh, thank you to both the discussants and the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, this has been a very interesting discussion. And uh, I think there are important ways to kind of look at and how China is kind of, uh, I think uh, there has always been like Ambassador uh, uh, said, uh, some of the VSAT like applications, how effective they are and so on and so forth and the usefulness in the in the sino indian border conflict uh, or any conflict between India and China. And that's is there are, there are questionable 
example, and there are questions around the efficiency and the usefulness and the adaptability of the PLA forces to those kind of systems. But I think, uh, again, once again, we don't have to make it 10 feet out of China, but at the same time, it's better to uh, uh, overestimate than underestimate. I were, so I think that's, uh, that's uh, I think, a useful approach uh, while looking at this particular question, especially given the kind of uh, relations that we contentious nature of India-China relations. I have not seen much of an improvement despite the economic uh, traction between the two sides, despite the so-called Wuhan spirit and so on and so forth. Uh, so there are issues that we really need to be more realistic about. Uh, and uh, of course, the how do you uh, how do you look at uh, uh, the perception of victory? I think again, that's something. So I, I agree with the uh, the two discussions and all of the all, all points that have been made. Uh, the, those are very very uh, essential uh, in in the, in contextualizing our debates in a sense. Uh, going over some of the questions, I think the, this has been always an important aspect: defense budget uh, budget versus preparedness. How prepared are we? I think there is a, um, uh, the defense budget is the lowest in the last two three years since the 1962 war as part of the, as, uh, as a component of the GDP. That itself tells you a lot. Second, even within that budget, much of it goes into the, into meeting the salaries and pensions. So the available amount allocation for actually capital expenditure to buy equipments, to modernize your forces is limited. And India has deficiencies of two kinds. One is to take into account the kind of capabilities that are being uh, developed or acquired in the neighborhood, including in China. Second is different uh, modernization driven uh, cycle the modernization cycles are uh, up. So we did some of the major acquisition process in 1980s and uh, 90s. Uh, so there, those have come up for uh, modernization. The next, uh, uh, we need to acquire more, uh, more recent, more advanced platforms. So there are different uh, requirements on India. And I think the, the kind of difference budget allocation that has been seen on for India is not, still, not, uh, uh, still not adequate. This has been amplified by military, senior military leadership uh, uh, time and again within parliaments and so on the, on the floor of the parliament. So again, not much of a, a, uh, something to be, um, I'm not trying to make up anything there. Second, uh, China's uh, expansion of its footprint into areas such as Indonesian, uh, South China Sea, Tibet, border areas with different countries. Uh, all of this is a problem. Uh, China, even in the, in the middle of a global pandemic, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, the countries are uh, address, trying very hard to deal with those pandemic issues, uh, the health infrastructure and so on and so forth. China has been pushing very aggressively in the South China Sea on, one, on the one side, second on, uh, on Taiwan as well as towards, um, uh, towards on Japan. Um, so China is, remains relentless in terms of pushing their aggressive designs in terms of uh, uh, in, in some sense, it is kind of taking advantage of the fact that other countries are are uh, are uh, addressing the pandemic-related issues and dealing with uh, severe health infrastructure issues and so on and so forth. So. PLA, in a sense, is taking advantage of such a situation where all the, uh, the attention of the major powers are diverted to such issues. PLA is making quick. Uh, uh, there have been certain pushbacks by some of these countries, whether it is Indonesia, Vietnam, sinking of a ship in a uh, fishing boat by, uh, by China in, the, in, in a couple of weeks ago. So there have been an increasing number of incidents. Certain amount of pushback has happened, but I think uh, one has to be, you can't take your eyes off in that sense uh, uh, as regards China's activities, whether it is on the Sino-Indian border areas, Indian Ocean, South China Sea, all of that. Uh, some questions on India's poor infrastructure, which is an uh, which is a disadvantage, but China's lack of op uh, operational experience and ex uh, uh, sort of an advantage to India. It it could have been an advantage to India if India had better infrastructure. We could have been our our ability to mobilize forces would have been that much greater. Second, if we are if you had a better infrastructure, you are also able to test out and validate the effectiveness of operational command and control issues, operational as well as mobilization uh, effectiveness, those kind of issues could have been uh, sorted out, could have been validated, uh, tried and tested out in that sense uh, if we had better infrastructure. So there are a certain amount of advantages uh, one could see because of the lack of operational experience on the part of the PLA. But I think those are negated by the fact that we also have uh, uh, our, our infrastructure is, is a, lot to, a lot more to be, a lot to desire in a sense. Um, 
Uh, there was another question on the uh, couple of different studies that have come out in the recent days about the Chinese, uh, India China uh, balance of power and conventional military terms and so on and so forth. Here again, I would argue that there are certain areas, certain pockets where India does enjoy a certain amount of uh, advantages, but I think there are serious, uh, because I think at the end of the day, you need to factor in the uh, 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 issue that. China is looking at the US as the competitor and it is building up, developing the capabilities to be a competitor to the US. So the kind of capabilities that are being developed or acquired are far greater than that of India. And shifting those to an Indian theater, uh, Sino-Indian border theater is, uh, is not that difficult. So India's, uh, even though there have been uh, certain areas and we have, uh, for instance, even Doklam happened, we managed to pull through without uh, firing a shot that those are uh, those are remarkable but i think those are also those also happened because of certain circumstantial uh, developments in a sense the fact that china was hosting the BRICS summit that came in handy that came in as a as a plus point for india therefore because there was a suspicion that prime minister modi may not travel to um, china for the uh, BRICS summit which would have raised a lot of questions on the part of uh, uh, for Xi Jinping to answer. And that is when China began to respond and sort of uh, uh, retract um, uh, from the Doklam situation. So there are still problems and China would not give away unless it is, uh, it is going to affect its own interests. Uh, but uh, overall conventional military power, I would not say that it is entirely in China's favor. Uh, it is in India's favor. It is, uh, there's a lot that is still desired for in terms of our capabilities um, and uh, to bring about better jointness and kind of things and integration of the forces. Uh, the India's uh, institution of the um, CDS is a good step, but I think we still have to see how that's going to play out, uh, how much, because you have traditionally seen quite a bit of bureaucratic resistance, uh, the MOD civilian bureaucracy, bureaucratic resistance in terms of giving a better say, giving a, a bigger say to the military leadership. Um, so this needs to be, it's too, still a bit early to kind of talk about as to how the CDS is going to play out and uh, how effective that institution is going to be. Um, I think I, I should... I, um, oh, of time, Raji. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> but thank you all for your comments and uh, questions. Would you amazing. like to um, make some remarks, but you'll have to be very brief. Uh, uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to thank all the discussants and the chair for a very fruitful discussion and I think it's raised a lot of important points and maybe Raji and I can delve deeper into them and come up with more papers along these lines as well. So just thank you for that and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bilkey now. Okay. Uh, well, uh, what, I'll, what I will uh, now say uh, by way of concluding remarks, I think, you know, um, I think that we did a uh, little bit, the discussion did wear off from the Tibet military exercises. So we've started, we discussed the, all of um, uh, the, uh, the issue. And I um, uh, agree with um, uh, Raji's uh, last point, you know, in the sense, uh, on the Sino-Indian border, the, actually we are pretty comfortably off. And that was evident in the Doklam uh, confrontation. Uh, the Chinese have a serious problem. I think uh, Brigadier Sina made this remark about acclimatization. <coughs> you know, it takes fully 14 days for troops to acclimatize, to be able to fight at a level of 12 to 14,000 feet. So it's six days for about 10,000 feet, four days for about 12,000 feet. So when we talk of this Chinese um, uh, capability of uh, uh, flooding Tibet with forces, you know, for 14 days, they'll be spending acclimatization, whereas our forces are much higher. That's one thing from the army point. The second thing is that uh, from the air force point of view, our air bases, the nature of the Himalayas, uh, is such that our aircraft can take off with a full load. The Chinese aircraft cannot take off with a full load. None of the Chinese air bases today have hardened shelters as of, uh, as of now. So there are serious imbalances. All our, uh, our air force is still superior to the, uh, what the Chinese can um, uh, field in Tibet. So I would uh, say that, yes, uh, there are issues. And I think important point to note, of course, is the issue of infrastructure, uh, where Raji is correct that, the, uh, the, the, that this has been a, uh, problem from our side. What I would suggest is that, you know, often instead of talking about it as military infrastructure, I come from the mountains, you should say this is for regional development, this is for local development. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, yeah, when you start saying this is for military roads, military is saying, what the hell? I would say, you know, <laughs> the, the point is the local people benefit and it should be, it should be pitched in that um, uh, particular uh, fashion. The uh, 
other point I'd like to make that, you know, we need a much better understanding. And I think this is exercise is linked to this much better understanding of the operational logistics and capabilities of both sides. Meaning we have one part of it is the physical infrastructure, but there is also operational logistics in the sense your warehousing, your ammunition depots, stockpiling, how can you support the forces? Because supporting forces in the mountains is a very, very tricky uh, issue. I mean, say so we are using everything from mules to trucks and, um, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, et cetera. So, so, so these are issues which could kind of feed into the whole thing. Uh, you know, as I started off by saying that there's an action reaction cycle and what we have noticed is that post Doklam, <laughs> the Chinese have begun in a big way to start constructing uh, their border infrastructure, which means that they have now realized that they need forces well up on the border, just as we did at one point in time. So in the future, you're likely to see more PLA uh, based in the, um, the border region um, than um, uh, anything else. But in any case, I would like to conclude by thanking everyone particularly the panelists, um, uh, uh, Mr. Nambiar, uh, Brigadier Sinha, our two speakers, uh, Dr. Raja Gopalan and Pulkit Mohan, uh, and also um, uh, the people who have supported us, you know, who are invisible uh, and who have been supporting us. And I apologize because uh, this is a completely new way of doing things. And we, uh, we have to uh, learn. We probably will get better and better. Uh, but from the Observer Research Foundation, I would like to thank all of you for participating. And one thing is there that we do manage to get much greater number of participants than we would get physically. So thank you again and uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you to all. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Jokshi. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.